Hey folks, Kevin here. Well, it's March 9th, 2019. I'm in the den uh, next to one of the growing stands, the uh, microgreens growing in here. And the sweet potatoes are, haven't started to sprout yet. I will do a, a video update when we do that. Uh, and I just recently plant, uh, started some uh, ginger as well. So in a couple of weeks time, we should have some sprouts coming up from that if all works out well. But today's episode is another episode of Ask Me Anything. About a year ago, I posted a video uh, about thermal mass, and I really went through the house explaining how, the, how we use the large thermal mass that's built into this passive solar home to, to store and to use convection currents to transfer heat, whether, whether we've captured the heat from the wood stove or we capture it through, these, uh, solar, um, through the windows on the south side of the house or through cooking or whatever the heck else that we're doing, we're, we're harvesting that heat and storing it. And one of the things that, uh, that Chris picked out when, uh, during the video, Chris, Chris com commented, nice house, but the flue pipe on the wood stove is too low. Absolutely right, good pickup. Thanks for, and thanks for commenting, Chris, I appreciate it. So that's a Yodel wood stove. It's actually our second Yodel wood stove. Years ago, we ended up renting the house out when Thea and I were in uh, Ithaca uh, going to vet school and then ultimately uh, doing my residency there and teaching there. Um, during that time, we rented the house out and there was a fair amount of damage done to the original Yodel wood stove. So we got a replacement for it, the exact same model and all, but they had changed some things and they actually put longer legs on the newer model unfortunately. Therefore the stove is a little bit higher and there's a downward pitch where the flue enters into the central chimney and that's a bit of a hassle but it's it's never given us a problem since installing it that way. It's a very short run. Heat is going to rise. It works its way up there uh, and we've had no uh, noxious gases uh, get into the house and it hasn't posed a fire hazard as well. But good, good pickup Chris. Thanks for the comment. Uh, recently I, I posted a video with uh, capturing the, some of the white-tailed deer uh, foraging in our first food forest, and that's the one south of the house, that food forest. And uh, Robert Harcourt had actually commented uh, or asked, have you considered providing hay for the deer until the spring uh, finally arrives? Really good question, and I think in most situations that'd probably be a really good idea. Um, as an environmentalist and naturalist, one of the things I'm always trying to do is to monitor the the uh, deer and see what their ac actual native habitat, uh, native native habits actually are, and um, and trying to make sure that we meet their needs. And I mentioned food force, and I've done videos on food force. So if you search for food force uh, in the videos, you'll see that under under permaculture topics. And food force, quite simply, are we uh, often people will think about it. Well, it's a really wonderful place where it's a, an organic orchard of various fruit and nut trees that are geogra geographically and climate appropriate for your setting. So we're here in the cold, temperate northeast. So those fruiting species that required so many hours of cold temperature and nut species, that works out really well. So you put them in their appropriate uh, ecosystem. And, uh, and, and in permaculture, we always try to uh, have diversity. We don't want monoculture, so we don't want just an apple orchard. And with, we can take the diversity to a much greater extents we can have polycultures uh, that are uh, that where we have companion planting that that uh, let's say that bring in the beneficial insects at different times that feed the wildlife as well that may deter certain pests and breaking up the uh, the monoclonal uh, you know like just having a cornfield or just an apple orchard or, or whatever it may be, or an almond uh, tree uh, farm. So we have a mixture of all different nuts and fruit trees, and we have an abundance of acorn uh, oak trees that produce acorns. We have many, many high bush uh, blueberry bushes and many, many different bushes that have soft 
uh, tender um, uh, branches and limbs on them that the deer naturally forage on during this time. We have the various, all the different uh, uh, barberries and uh, uh, most people would think of some like the rose hips and those sorts of things. Well, the deer are eating these things all throughout our winters here, as well as all the other wildlife. And we have video of the raccoons feeding here, the possums, the, the, um, the skunks, and many of those are out during, they're nocturnal, so we see them at nighttime, where the white-tailed deer are crepuscular, meaning actively feeding by uh, dusk and dawn, but they're actually out there feeding midday as well. Those of you who have, have worked around uh, white-tailed deer recognize that they don't follow that, that dogma that's been uh, described in the past. So they're really hardy, and there's two additional reasons why I don't like using crops like hay. Uh, one reason is I can't be certain that, that the hay is actually uh, is going to be free of pesticides. Some of the pesticides that are used, such as Roundup, uh, some, some folks will use their, their, uh, their soybean or their corn crops and then put hay in for a few years, but if they've used Roundup, that glyphosate stays there, is still in the soil, uh, and it gets, the, uh, it gets uptaken by many other uh, plant species and they adapt to, to these pesticides. So I try to reduce the chances of bringing in various pesticides onto, onto our property. The, the other reason is when we study the, the wildlife, uh, it's, we're so used to eating three meals a day that uh, we don't really appreciate probably what our ancestors were actually like, where we actually you know, had periods of fasting, prolonged fasting. And that's why those really fat containing uh, seeds and nuts are, are so good. And then the twigs give us give the cellulose for the for the deer for the uh, for the uh, fermenting, for the uh, uh, for the microorganisms that actually live within their gut, which is quite a bit different than uh, are omnivore or even carnivore guts. So they can go for significant periods. And with some of the more recent uh, studies that have been shown, that uh, one of the wrappings of our DNA are the t telomeres, which help to prolong longer health span and lifespans. Well, the telomeres are actually uh, in, uh, enhanced to uh, create uh, better, better seals, better caps on our DNA, which is a good thing by periods of fasting. And that's why this day and age you hear people talking about intermittent fasting and, and, uh, or having prolonged periods be between meals and that sort of thing. Not all of which I think are good or like the fasting mimicking diet, which is, I think is a good thing. So uh, that is a long answer <laughs> to, to your question, Robert, but the main thing is we're always trying to study and learn as much as we can about the natural habits of the species that are on, on this property and what sort of things we can learn from what they're doing, such as me mentioning in that video, we don't cut the, the grasses, the clovers and all that. And there'll be areas where, you, where they dig down and they'll be mowing that stuff right down. So it's maybe 18 inches long where the clover may be eight inches high and they've just mowed that right down to, to just about nothing. In the areas where the wood chips have been put there and it's been heavily sheet mulched over the years, they will dig right down and you'll just see brown spots there and my theory is that they're actually eating some of the mycelium part of the underground network of the mushrooms that we can't actually see so i hope this this helps to clarify uh the reason why we we don't do it oh the other thing i would say is every day uh, when thea cleans out the aviary all of the seed material and feed material that comes out of there, the breads and all those materials that, that we feed uh, the birds in the aviary, that goes out. And we, we're always feeding the birds with the, at the bird feeders, so there's all the seed that goes on the ground at the base of the bird feeders. And so that's a big hot spot as well. So I hope this, this cleared up what we're doing. We're, we're trying to purposely do what we think is the very best thing and we're always learning new things. 
So if you found this video of value, please give us a thumbs up, share it with your friends, hit that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we post more videos. And certainly folks have a great day. Stay warm. Bye bye now.